You've heard about climate change, but how do we know? How do we know humans are changing the climate? How do we know what the climate will be in the future? Well, join me on a trip and I'll show you how we know. Well, I'm back in the Antarctic again and I'm doing some experiments about climate change. The first experiment is happening right here. Sun is shining through the windshield of the piston bully, strikes the black interior, and it warms up the interior. But the heat can't radiate back out through the windshield. The windshield is transparent to light, but it blocks the heat from radiating back out. That's the first experiment. That's why the greenhouse effect makes the inside of the cab warm. The second experiment is really happening on a global scale, and it's happening as humans introduce greenhouse gases like methane and carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. To understand the science of climate change, we're going to start here in Antarctica where we're doing some science, and we're going to travel to other locations where we continue to work on that science. I've come here to study how natural changes in greenhouse gases influenced climate in the past, and then we're going to use that information so that we can make better predictions about how the human-caused increases in greenhouse gases that are occurring now will influence climate in the future. This is polar snow. It feels kind of like styrofoam, but it's really interesting stuff. It contains chemicals and gases that are characteristic of the climate when the snow fell. Now even on a balmy summer day like this, the snow around here never melts. It just gets buried deeper and deeper by more snow, and when it gets down to 300 feet or so, it gets compressed into ice, just absolutely solid ice. And that ice still contains a record of what the climate was when the snow fell. I'm standing on top of two miles of ice, solid ice, two miles thick. The ice at the bottom fell as snow 100,000 years ago, and it's been stacking up for 100,000 years, year after year, forming layer after layer. And it contains a record of the climate for that 100,000 years. To get that information, we have to go below the surface, though, and dig it out. There are a couple snow pits here. Let's go down below the surface, and you'll be able to check out the layering in the snow. This is a special snow pit. The top of it's covered with plywood so you don't get any sunlight shining directly into the snow pit. But on each side of these two walls, there's an adjoining snow pit, which is open. And so the sunlight can shine into that adjoining pit. And then the light shines through these very thin walls. And that really highlights all the different layers that you can see in here. Now this dark layer up in here, that dark layer fell as snow last winter. And these series of lighter bands here they fell as snow last summer. So this is one year's worth of snowfall at this particular site. And that, of course, will get buried by next winter's snowfall and get pushed down deeper and turn into ice. And that ice will contain a record of what the climate conditions were when the snow fell. So my colleagues and I, we read this kind of like just a giant stack of weather reports going back through time. Well, this snow pit only goes back about two and a half years. And to go further back in time, though, we have to go a lot deeper. And that's why we have a drill. Let's go check out that drill. You're right. The scenery here is monotonous. You can travel the 600 miles of South Pole and it looks the same. But this is the best place on the planet to study how past changes in greenhouse gases influence climate because it has the right combination of high annual snowfall and clean, deep ice. On a nice summer day, it's great to be out here. Huge sky, clean snow to the horizon, and it's an easy commute to work. This is our drilling shelter. It's a steel arch building. And inside of it, of course, we have the drill. The drill is laid out horizontally right now. It's actually a one-of-a-kind drilling tool. It's unlike any kind of water well or oil well drill. It's actually much more of a scientific instrument than a piece of drilling machinery. The business end of it is right down here. It has four razor-sharp cutters. The drill is moved up into a vertical position and then lowered down into the ice sheet. This drilling head then rotates around, and these cutters shave off a ring of ice. The drill slips down into that ring of ice and the core slides up into the core barrel. We then pull up on the core barrel and there are little latches in here that catch the core and we bring the core up to the surface.
drill work area is just a little below freezing. But to keep the gas samples trapped in the ice, we have to keep the temperature of the ice core below minus 20 C. So on the other side of the window, where the core is pushed out of the drill, it's always cold. We even have a large refrigeration system to make sure it stays cold. We collect about 8 feet of core each time the drill goes down the hole. The core is pushed out into a green plastic net, and that net protects the core from damage. This is a thin slice of an ice core. If you look at it under a special light fixture, the ice is black and the bubbles are white. The pen is pointing to the bubbles. The gas in these bubbles is a sample of the atmosphere from when the snow is compressed into ice. One of the few measurements we make in the field is to identify the annual layers in the ice. Snow that falls in the summer has different chemicals than the snow that falls in the winter. That makes the electrical conductivity of the ice different in different seasons. So by measuring the electrical conductivity of the ice, we can identify the annual layers in the ice core and count them to determine how old the ice is. It's sort of like counting tree rings. Each peak on this graph is one year. This one meter piece of core has three years of ice in it. The ice is packed in tubes and boxes to prepare for shipment back to the United States. We store the ice here until a plane comes to take it away. Depending on the weather, we might have to wait a couple weeks for a plane. Midnight, I think you can't really tell because the sun never sets, just kind of goes round and round and round. And when it's blowing like this, you don't even know where the sun is. I know it's been a long day and it's time for bed. But, uh, this is great weather for making an ice cores. This is how you make ice cores right here. And we're supposed to get a plane tomorrow, but I think the chance of seeing a plane tomorrow are about the same as seeing a penguin fly. The ice cores are flown a thousand miles to McMurdo Station. Then they're put on a ship and taken to California. Then they move by truck to Denver. We'll see these cores again in Denver. After the ice cores come back from Antarctica, we bring them here to this facility. This is the National Ice Core Laboratory in Denver, and it's run by the United States Geological Survey. Each one of these silver tubes in it has a meter of ice. There's 18,000 tubes here. And you can think of this as kind of a giant library full of ancient weather reports. Each one of these is sort of a book with a different history in it. That was the GIST II core from Greenland. Over here we have some cores from East Antarctica, Vostok, Taylor Dome, and Seipel Dome, and West Antarctica is over in here. We don't just store the ice cores here. We also prepare ice samples for measurements that are made in about 25 university labs all over the United States. We cut the core lengthwise to make long sticks of ice. For some measurements, we also cut the long sticks of ice into smaller samples. Each one of these small samples, which is about the size of your thumb, contains about a month's worth of snowfall. The samples get sealed in bags and are then sent to the labs. Each lab specializes in a particular measurement and has its own science team. 
Let's visit two of those labs. So after we cut the ice up at the National Ice Core Laboratory, we take it to labs like this one here at Oregon State University, which is run by doctors Ed Brook and Jinho An. And we extract the air to measure gases like carbon dioxide. And we do that in a specially designed apparatus, a vacuum chamber, uh, where we can crush the ice under vacuum and release the air. The first step is to put the ice into the vacuum chamber. The chamber has a mechanical system that can crush the ice. We put the lid on and pump all the air out of the chamber. Then we crush the ice. This releases the ancient air that was trapped in the ice. We use these valves and tubes to transfer the gas to a gas chromatograph. The gas chromatograph measures what the concentration of carbon dioxide was in the ancient air. The large peak shows the amount of carbon dioxide in the ancient air. So you can see how in this lab, Ed and Jinho measure the concentration of carbon dioxide in the past. And we also want to determine what the air temperature was when that snow fell. And in order to do that, we have to go to a different lab. Let's go to Colorado and check that out. We're at the University of Colorado in Boulder here. This is the laboratory of Professor Jim White. Jim makes the measurements that we use to determine how cold it was when the snow fell. Jim, how do you do that? Well, we can use stable isotopes to tell us how cold snow was when it fell. When snow is warm, we have more deuterium. When snow is cold, we have less deuterium. We calibrate that thermometer like you would calibrate any other thermometer, and then we read that thermometer by going down an ice core. So after the sample is melted, we transfer the water to a sample rack. Then we connect the sample rack to a mass spectrometer. And the mass spectrometer measures the concentration of the different isotopes of hydrogen. So there's a well understood relationship between the deuterium to hydrogen ratio and temperature. Yeah, well it's going to take me about a couple more years to finish drilling that ice core. And how long is it going to take you to finish making the measurements? Well, at least a year after you're done, Ken. Alright, so let's take a look at the results from the Epica Dome C ice core. The Epica Dome C project was designed to look far back in time. It produced a climate record that goes back 650,000 years. Using hydrogen isotopes, we know how the temperature changed. And using the gas bubbles in the ice, we know how the concentration of carbon dioxide changed. There are two interesting things about this record. First is the tight linkage between greenhouse gases and temperature. When the atmospheric concentration of carbon dioxide was high, the temperature was warm. And every time the carbon dioxide was low, the temperature was cold. The second interesting thing is that the current level of carbon dioxide is higher now than it's been at any time during at least the last 650,000 years. This increase is caused by human activity. It's not a natural increase. So the data show that small changes in greenhouse gases can actually have a big influence on our climate. And they also help us to calibrate that relationship between carbon dioxide and climate. But really, in order to look into the future, we're going to need climate models. Computer models of climate start with a numerical image of the Earth. The surface of the Earth is divided into a grid of squares. Each square covers land, water, or ice. Above each square, the atmosphere is divided into boxes. Each box in the atmosphere is associated with an air temperature, a wind speed, and other parameters. The ocean is also divided into boxes. Each box in the ocean is associated with an ocean temperature, ocean currents, and other parameters. The flow of water and heat between all the boxes is controlled by physical laws. For example, the amount of wind entering a box has to equal the amount of wind blowing out of the box. And if the amount of sunlight falling on a surface is more than the amount of sunlight reflected by the surface, the surface gets hotter. There are equations that we use to describe the transfer of mass and energy between all the different boxes. And it takes a lot of calculations to keep track of everything, so we have to use some very serious computers to do that. Let's go to another spot where they have those serious computers and we do, do the serious climate modeling that we need to predict what's going to happen in the future. This is a supercomputer center at the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado. It's one of a dozen places where powerful computers are used to model climate. These aren't normal computers. It has hundreds of disk drives, 
and even that can't hold all the information, so there are robots that handle all the tapes. This display shows the calculated ocean currents and temperature. The models are able to calculate all the ocean currents and temperatures, including small-scale features like these eddies. We check how accurate the models are by comparing the calculated climate to the real climate. In this model run, the map on the top is showing changes in surface temperature over time. Red areas are warmer than it was in the late 1800s, and blue areas are colder. The date and average temperature change are shown here. The graph on the bottom compares what the global average temperature really was, which is shown by the brown line, to what the model calculates the temperature was, which is shown by the black line. Notice that the black and the brown line are very close to each other, so we know the models are working well. The model takes into account things like volcanic eruptions, solar changes, and changes in the atmospheric concentration of greenhouse gases. To get the calculated climate to agree with the real climate, the model has to include the greenhouse gases that humans have introduced into the atmosphere. The current climate warming cannot be explained by just natural changes in volcanic activity or the sun. When you do a careful study with all the data and good models, it's clear the current warming is caused by human activity. This is not a natural climate change that's occurring. This display also shows what will happen in the future for different levels of greenhouse gases. On the lower graph, you can see how the temperature increases for different levels of greenhouse gases. The lower yellow line is the amount of climate warming that would occur if we stop all greenhouse gas emissions today. We are committed to this much climate change right now. The blue line shows the warming that will occur if we rapidly switch to clean and resource efficient technologies. The green line shows the warming that will occur if we use a combination of carbon and non-carbon energy sources. The top map is showing what the changes will be in different regions for this scenario. The red line shows the warming that will occur if we keep increasing our production of greenhouse gases like we are now. This would cause immense problems. If this happens, you're going to want to move to someplace cooler. Like maybe back to Antarctica. The science is very clear. We don't just make this up. Humans are changing climate. And the decisions that we make in the next few years will determine if these changes are manageable or if they have large adverse consequences for our society. So thank you for taking the time to learn about the science so that you can make an informed decision on this topic. Thank you.